if you'll turn to the book of Galatians. Tonight I want to begin with verse 11 of chapter 2 through 19. Chapter 2, verse 11 through 19. Now the message tonight is going to be dealing with still Paul's vindication of his message because through this whole section, that's really what he's doing. From chapter 1, verse 11, through the whole of chapter 2, he's vindicating his message how that he got it by revelation. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. But before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners like the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin, God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Peter was trying to do what Jesus said was impossible over in Matthew 9, putting new wine into old wineskins. It wouldn't work then, it isn't going to work today. And so I want to deal tonight with several aspects of how that a large segment of the charismatic movement is trying to put the new wine message into old wineskins. First of all, we see this in the present emphasis upon charismatic renewal. Charismatic renewal rather than charismatic restoration. We'll see the distinction as we get into the study. Charismatic renewal rather than charismatic restoration. Now, in one of the issues of a religious paper, There was an article entitled, Separate but United in Christ. Now, (laughs) if we have to tell you that that's an utter contradiction, why, then we might have to pray for your mind so you can understand what a contradiction is. But the title of the article, dealing with charismatic renewal in this religious paper, was Separate but United in Christ. That was last year's paper I'm referring to, and I just got a new account of the same type meeting. It's the Protestants and Catholics find unity in the spirit at a charismatic rally. This was one just recently held in New Jersey. And they speak of the unity, there's that word again, unity among Christians of separated denominations. They don't realize they're using in Congress terms contradictions. How can you have unity when you're differing. Well, their unity is a spirit of unity, but that's of the world. That isn't the Holy Spirit outpouring today. And let me just say that I trust some of you don't have any trouble with this kind of preaching because if you do, I don't know what you're doing here in a tent because there are a lot more comfortable places to be. No dust to settle in your newly washed hair. Air conditioned, stained glass windows, And all we've got is some stained glass lights. But I trust you don't have any trouble with this message because the hour is so short that God is trying to show you what the majority of charismatics don't see and no one is telling them. That God is not pouring out His Spirit so that we can all have an identical experience and unite on that in meetings occasionally called charismatic. He's not renewing anything. It's called charismatic renewal that we're getting into tonight. He's restoring something, which is apostolic church, apostolic experience, apostolic baptism, apostolic healing, apostolic ministry, apostolic faith. That's what he's restoring. But anyway, 
This just occurred, unity among Christians of differing denominations. And it's the Jesus 78, the giant charismatic renewal. Now some people would never know that that isn't what the Holy Spirit is doing today unless you told them that it isn't what he's doing. He isn't renewing anything. He's restoring. And it's called an interfaith gathering. That's another contradiction. Because Ephesians 4 speaks of the unity of the faith. Not an interfaith where you just keep on believing what you believe that man taught you and all of us have a right to believe what we want. There's going to be one faith by the time the Holy Spirit gets done with us. And it was sponsored, of course, by Lagos International and the People of Hope, a Catholic charismatic group. And the rally featured such speakers as Ruth Carter Stapleton and so on. I'll just mention the one name. Now some of you may not be aware that she doesn't have the message of the hour by any means. <laughs> just in case you don't know it, we told you. Well, that's the up-to-date one, but the one I had a note of was last year in the National Courier. The article was entitled Separate but United in Christ, and it gives a report on the Conference for the Charismatic Renewal of the Churches. And again, by the way, that went on to say it was mostly Catholic. Now, I'm not up here criticizing charismatic Catholics. I trust by the time we get done, you'll see the significance. But that one this year was mostly Catholic. And then this one that I'm reporting to you was 46% Catholic. And the leaders of that meeting were the teachers and founders of the Shepherdship Error. So you've got half Catholic and the rest of them are the leaders of the Shepherdship Error. And the purpose and the emphasis of that meeting, according to this article, which I'm more or less quoting, is charismatic renewal by the Holy Spirit while maintaining the denominational structures, organization, and creeds. You see what they're doing? They're renewing man system. Charismatic renewal. Isn't the devil subtle? Because people are standing in line to absorb that error. In other words, institutional religion is not to change. They're superimposing the charismatic experience, the Holy Spirit, upon the denominational system, the institutional system. Now, all of this is in contrast, by the way, to the outpouring in 1900, as well as the present purpose of God in the present-day outpouring. In 1900, what you had when the outpouring of this century began, which is the latter-day outpouring, what you had was a group of people who were hungering and thirsting for more of God out of all the dead churches. See, the only reason you have the baptism is because you recognize you were dead in your system, your religious system. And they don't seem to realize that when they get the baptism, they're not supposed to stay in the dead system. In 1900, when God poured his spirit out as they were seeking and searching for more of God, and then for many years after that, those people did not go back in those dead systems, they became what we know today as Pentecostals. Of course, we've got second and third generation Pentecostals today that do not have the faith message. But you read their early history, and that's the history of the miraculous and the supernatural and the believing for broken bones and the whole ball of wax. But as someone said, God has no grandchildren. And so you have to have a fresh outpouring for each generation. What we're witnessing today among the Roman Catholics, Episcopalians, Anglicans, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Methodists, Baptists, and all the denominations is an attempt to fit the charismatic experience into the old denominational mold, our wineskin. And Jesus said you can't do that. You can't put this new wine message in the old wineskins. In fact, they won't have anything to do with it, and I don't have to tell you that. You can't put the new wine message of speaking in tongues, healing, deliverance from demons, miracles in the old wine bottles of institutional religion because Jesus said it would burst. Amen. And so if you try to put the new wine message in the old religious wineskins, it will either burst the old wineskin to kingdom come like Jesus said it would, or you'll spill the new wine and lose it. And that's what's happening. They're losing the new wine in the old system. They quench the spirit. They can't function charismatically in the old system. So you either lose the wine or the bottle or both. If you turn over to chapter 9 of Matthew, I'd like for you to see what Jesus said 
about this before we go any further. Because this is just one of the ways, like Peter was trying to put the new wine experience he had and message into the old Jewish system, and Paul rebuked him publicly. Well, you say he was an apostle. Well, so was Peter. All right, verses 16 and 17 of Matthew 9. No man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. And neither do men put the new wine into old bottles, literally wineskins. The Greek is wineskins. They didn't have bottles back then. Else the wineskins break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine in new bottles, and both are preserved. Now, of course, when he's saying the new bottles, he's talking about the New Testament pattern that he's bringing. And what God is doing is restoring that. He isn't renewing man's system, but he's restoring that pattern. The new wine has to go in the new wineskins. But the new wineskins, of course, are the ones that he brought. Not that we have new ones today, or we just become another denomination. But the entire stress in this conference, as you read this article, is upon renewal. Renewal of the old wine. I mean, what does renewal suggest? Well, it's always renewal of something that's old. Renewal of the status quo. You can't renew something that's new. You just renew the old. Now, renewal, charismatic renewal, would be all right if God had divided his body up into 250 plus pieces, over 250. Then, if that's the way he did it, then it would be good to renew what he did. Charismatic renewal would be all right if God's the author of all this doctrinal confusion. If he's the author of all this confusion, then renewal of that confusion is all right. If he's the one that gave us 16 ways to baptize, then that's all right. We'll renew those 16 ways. Because interfaith, they've got at least that many ways when they all meet together. And if God is the one who said that I'm the author of all of this diversity because that shows how complex my wisdom is, you know, to divide everything up into a lot of parts, none agreeing. If he's the author of all that, then of course it's all right to renew it. But you see, there's one thing the leaders of charismatic renewal overlook, and that is that God did not establish the institutional system of man. I don't understand why that upsets some people because it only proves to me they've never read the New Testament because Jesus repeatedly, in fact, his most scathing denunciations are against the institutional system, religious system of his day. Why do we think this system today is any better off or to be blessed by God any more than that of Jesus' day? And he wouldn't have a thing to do with it. He absolutely repudiated it. It wasn't the Old Testament, it wasn't Judaism, it wasn't Moses, it wasn't the law, it was man's tradition. The same thing we've got today. The Old Testament economy was to prevail until the cross, till Pentecost, and they didn't have that. They had man's traditions. Over and over and over and over he says that. And so what the leaders of charismatic renewal overlook is that God is not the author of what they're trying to renew. He isn't pouring out his spirit in order to renew the churches men have established, but to restore the church that Jesus established. The New Testament pattern, where we have, you know, body ministry and the miraculous and the faith message and the fivefold ministry and all that you see in the New Testament. Now, it may sound pious and religious to hear terms like charismatic ecumenical movement. That's their term. They're using that now, the charismatic ecumenical movement. That may not mean anything to some people, but that's because you're not studying the history of Christianity and contemporary Christianity. As soon as you say ecumenical, you've already labeled yourself in the wrong camp. Because that's the liberal term. You see, the world church wants us all to have this interfaith business. And this one over here denies the deity of Christ. This one over here sprinkles. And that one back there immerses and... This one over here believes in inspiration of Scripture, but let's don't bring those things up as we said last week. Because that's divisive. That offends some people. That's your interfaith. You don't dare tell the Roman Catholic priest that it's a grievous sin to worship Mary. 
Because if you do, you offend your brother. Because he speaks in tongues like you, and that's the only basis for getting together. Let's have this charismatic experience. Now, don't misunderstand before you get too far along. If there's one thing this present-day outpouring has done, it has broken down barriers and brought people together where you can see a Pentecostal and a Catholic priest with his collar on backwards embracing, loving one another, and not criticizing one another. God has to break down barriers before he can get the message in, you see. So don't misunderstand. There's a place for that initially, where he's getting people together initially to see that there is one body of Christ, not theirs and not ours and not somebody else's, but there's one which he's forming, restoring to the New Testament pattern. But if it stops there, if it stops with an attempt to pour the new wine into the old institutional wineskins, then it's a frustration of the purpose of God in pouring out His Spirit. Now, we can't overemphasize that. And we're going to say it to the chairs and the floor and the tent poles. If people don't get a hold of that, then we say in love, but we say it. You're in the wrong place because that's the message of the hour. That's the message God has given us. We challenge you to check out the message with the Word of God. You find your denomination in this book, and we'll change to that. I challenge anybody to find most of what's going on in the religious systems of men in this book. But it doesn't make any difference to most people. But don't misunderstand the message. God is pouring out His Spirit upon all flesh. And if a Catholic had to cease to be a Catholic the day he got the baptism, most of them probably wouldn't get it. And that goes for Baptists. Amen. Hear what we're saying. There's a place for this breaking down of barriers by the Spirit of God. But that's not where it's supposed to end. If our purpose in receiving this blessed experience ends with trying to put new wine in old wineskins, God's purpose is utterly frustrated. Because he's not renewing anything, he's restoring. I don't know why man always tries to manipulate the power and the Spirit of God. Everything man touches, he tries to manipulate it. Why does a man just leave it alone? Why do not people just leave Christianity alone and let it speak for itself, let it vindicate itself? Why do people have to manipulate the Holy Spirit and become charismatic Lutherans and what have you? And as to say, we can say whatever, Baptist or Methodist. If they'll leave the Holy Spirit alone, He'll show them that there's no relationship between the systems of men and what God established, what Jesus established in the flesh when He was on earth. No relationship whatever. And that is what He's restoring in the present day outpouring. You remember the vision last week that we read to you? That God's going to judge these ministers harshly who are afraid to speak the truth. And very few have the message or the courage that God has given this church. When are charismatics going to believe that you can't put this new wine message into old wineskins? There's no such thing as a charismatic Baptist church. I know some are called that. But the basic mistake of those who are promoting charismatic renewal is thinking that God is pouring His Spirit out to make you a better whatever you are. No, He isn't. He isn't trying to make you a better Catholic or a better Baptist or a better Lutheran. He's trying to make you a better Christian. I agree with John Osteen. I heard him say it several years ago. He said, these Baptists, and that's what he was telling other Baptists, you need this experience because it'll make you a better Baptist. He says, on the contrary, it'll make you a terrible Baptist. He said, it'll make you the worst Baptist you'll ever see. But he says, it'll make you a better Christian. God isn't pouring out His Spirit to make you a better something that man invented. And I don't know why people have to be almost coerced into believing that. God is pouring out His Spirit to restore the New Testament pattern of the church. Jesus established the church the way He wanted it, the way it pleased Him. And if man touches that, God's going to judge him. I mean, it's hard for me to believe what one man said to me one time in an institution where I taught. Oh, he said, I believe God is the author of all these denominations, you know, the diversity of it. It's hard to believe that an educated man in the Word of God could make such a statement. 
Church in the New Testament's an organism. As soon as a man touches it, it becomes an organization. There's a rare exception, and you're sitting in it. We refuse to incorporate it, label it, or do anything with it, except just call it His assembly. And since He's given us the message of faith, it's the faith assembly. The New Testament church is an organism. You know without me telling you, the institutional church is an organization with its staff. It's run on the order of a corporation with its president and board of directors and trustees and the whole bit. Even you are the stockholders. We can't do a thing without your vote, you know. The church in the New Testament is body ministry. I don't have to tell you the institutional church is an ecclesiastical hierarchy. There are two groups in man's church. That's the clergy and laity. In God's church, there's one group. One! And whatever gifts and callings we have are functional. Some are leadership gifts. Some carry more authority than the others. But none are any more important than the other because, well, read 1 Corinthians 12 and Paul will tell you, if you're the little toe, you are necessary to the body. The Church of the New Testament is not something you join, it's something you're baptized into by the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Church of man is something you join and hold by letter and a membership, and if you don't like the way things are run, you ask for your letter and take it across the street and you join that one. They're happy to get you. The Church of the New Testament was charismatic from the beginning. It wasn't superimposed upon something. It was charismatic from the beginning. The Church of Man, the institutional church, is attempting to superimpose the charismatic experience upon man's religious system. And I'll tell you at the outset that they'll stand only so much of that, and some won't stand any of it. You cannot superimpose this experience upon man's system. They won't put up with it. I told you last week in the message how the Baptist Association in Dallas, this was in a religious paper, put out of its fellowship those churches that had become charismatic. The same paper, same year, last year, the Nazarene Convention, which is their convention of churches, have outlawed the Holy Spirit in speaking in tongues. It doesn't matter that it's in the Bible. Like those Baptists said to those charismatic churches, those churches calling themselves charismatic, say, we don't care if the baptism is taught in the Bible. We don't practice it in our church. I mean, that's a quote from what the leader said. The Nazarenes don't care that tongues are in the Bible or the baptism of the Holy Spirit is in the Bible. They've outlawed it. So that means, you know, that it's not for today because they've outlawed it. Well, I'm going to stay with the Word. I've talked to people in a large Baptist church in Louisville, several of them when I was there several years ago preaching, who said that the saturation point of our church was 30. When 30 of us got the baptism, we were all kicked out. I'm saying you can't superimpose this experience upon the institutional system because they won't put up with it. Saturation point sometimes is one, sometimes it's eight. I know a Methodist church where it was eight. But there is a saturation point because they cannot endure it. Students where I taught were expelled because they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Some pastors are a part of this fellowship who were put out of their pastors because they received the baptism. You see, institutional religion never has and never will accept any move of the Spirit. Never has, never will. Didn't in Jesus' day. Why? Because it's a threat to their system. They can't receive it. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 13, we read these words. The institutional leaders of Jesus' day said, when they heard them speaking in tongues, what meaneth this? And what was the reply of institutional religion? They mocked. They said, these men are drunken on that new wine message. And that's what Jesus meant when he said, and he said it before Pentecost, you cannot put this new wine message in the old wineskins. Charismatic renewal, that's not God and he won't bless it. He isn't renewing man's ways. He's restoring and so what Jesus said you can't do is precisely what the leaders of charismatic renewal are futilely trying to do. It wouldn't work then, it won't work today. You better believe it won't work today. I can show you it won't work then on the day of Pentecost. 
Those who were drinking the old wine, those who were members of the old institutional system, they saw right away they couldn't put the new wine in the old wineskins. Why? Because the religious leaders of the institutional system of Jesus' day rejected it. They rejected practically 100% their message. Secondly, they saw they couldn't put the new wine into their old wineskins of religion because they began to suffer persecution. And thirdly, by the end of the first century, before the end of the first century, the church had changed from the institutional Jewish system to a Gentile church. Now that's significant. There's no way to put it in that old system. So the church ceased to be Jewish, and it was at first, Jerusalem, Pentecost, and it's almost totally Gentile before the end of the first century. Which means that as you read the book of Acts, you'll see over and over that as they offered again and again the message to the Jews, Paul said, I would first go to the Jews, to the old wineskins, and offer them the message, and time and time again they rejected it. That's the message of the book of Acts. Now, just as Peter and Paul and John and the other apostles offered them the new wine and told them it's better than the old, we too have the privilege and the responsibility of offering them the new wine, those who are drinking the old, because that's how you got to taste the new wine. Somebody had to offer it to you. And we're still offering it to the people because we have, oh, I guess 40 or more meetings that go out of here every week all over the area and some pretty far away sometimes. Offering people the new wine because people out of all of the institutions of men come into those meetings and hear the faith message and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and hear the untimed message. So we're offering them a new wine. It's our obligation. You don't because you have the new wine, just reserve it all for yourself and lock it up in your wine cellar. No, you're going to share it. We have radio ministries, literature, books, tapes, ministries sometimes too right in the center of denominationalism where we go into the churches. I've been in many of them with this new wine message. They didn't all receive it, but I've been in them. Because they've got to drink the new wine before God can restore the New Testament pattern. Else... Oh, they've got the old, and he can't restore or renew that because he's not in it. Now hear me, God is not in the institutional system. If you have any trouble swallowing that one day, you're going to find out, but it may be too late for you, that that's just the way it is. It's Ichabod, it's Babylon. God did not divide his body up. How could he be in something that opposes him? Take them the Holy Spirit and the miracles and the faith message and the deeper life and see what they do with it. That's enough evidence that it's not of God because if it was, they'd recognize the Holy Spirit when He came. And I was reading after God gave me this message. Here's someone else. I'm happy to see someone else sees it. By the way, he's got a prophecy here he crossed out. He says, this is a true or false prophecy. And the title of the prophecy is, Bloom Where You're Planted. Well, two or three of you got it. The rest of you, I'll explain it. The prophecy said, don't leave your denominational system because God is getting ready to bless it because of your loyalty and allegiance to your forefathers who founded those systems. Can you believe that? And goes on and on, a prophecy like that. So the author of the paper, he calls it a false prophecy. Amen. Bloom where you're planted. In other words... God is baptizing the Spirit to stay where you are and dry back up. Which is what happens. Oh, you better believe it's what happens. So he said that we are convinced that the Holy Spirit is trying to say to these national charismatic leaders that God is not pouring out His Spirit to renew the denominational church, but to renew His church. Of course, he used the word renewal, and it's actually restoration, but at least he got the point. He sees the difference. Praise God, somebody else saw it. Bloom where you're planted? You'll never bloom where you're planted. You'll bloom if you get out of that rut of religion that you've walked into with your eyes wide open. God isn't going to take the blame for it. So that's the first way in which we see the charismatic movement, which we're a part of, so we're concerned about it, and God's going to have His prophets and teachers speaking out in this end time to warn those who will listen. 
He's got his people who will hear this message. Now, a second way in which the charismatic movement is trying to put new wine into old wineskins, a second way is the failure of some charismatics to obey the scriptural admonition to come out from among unbelievers and their sinful ways and be separate. They're trying to mingle the wine of their new life experience with the old wine of the world. And there's a lot of them doing that, a lot of charismatics. An example of what I'm talking about are those personalities, so many of them in the entertainment industry, that when they get saved and baptized in the Spirit, they stay in the movies, singers, TV personalities, sports, and so on. Now, some see the contradiction right away and get out of it. But others are so in love with their careers, they stay in and associate and fellowship with the old, unregenerate world that God saved them out of. And they attempt to justify this by saying, well, I'll be a witness. They wouldn't have a witness if I wasn't there. Just my presence as a Christian will be a witness. And you know that satisfies most people. It may satisfy some of you. I hope not. They say, well, I'm a witness out there. I'll be a witness. Just my presence as a Christian will be a witness. And I want to tell you something. You can take it or leave it, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. If you stacked all the people in them that ever got saved by that kind of witness, they wouldn't reach across this tent and back. Their witness is tainted. Witness is tainted. One article I cut out, out of the National Courier, is entitled, The Devil's Coach is a Believer. They don't see the incongruity of that, the inconsistency. The devil's coach is a believer. And then it goes on after it gets your attention to tell how this spirit-filled believer is the coach of a baseball team called the so-and-so's devils. I think this was Arizona Devils or something. Well, now he sees no contradiction there at all. And they thought that was really great. The devil's coach is a believer. And then another article out of the same paper tells how one leading singer who thinks nothing of appearing on the Sonny and Cher show with her navel hanging out, if she had a name called Sex, that would be what she was trying to get across to people. And this charismatic, at least he calls himself that, popular singer appeared on there, danced with her, sang songs with her, and went on to perform in the Playboy Hotel. What's his justification for all that? He said if Christians in the entertainment industry leave it, then it will be left to the devil. <laughs> and I thought when I read that, I wonder who in the world does he think is in control of it now? Since it appeared in the National Courier, and since Dave Wilkerson is the one who said it, and they sent it all over the country, and some of you, I guess, read it, then we'll just read some excerpts here, where Wilkerson says there's just something wrong about the charismatic movement to where we've become so enamored with fellowship with one another because we have the Spirit, we overlook holiness and more important things. And he quotes Pat Boone, and he admits that he entertained in the Playboy Hotel and said, well, it was worth it because some people told me they were touched by my witness. Touched? I don't find that term in the Bible. God hasn't sent us out to touch people. <laughs> but to say repent or perish. Yeah. And to get people converted, changed, new creatures. Oh, touch some people. And so Wilkerson went on national television to criticize and name such Christians as Pat Boone, Johnny Cash, and Orr Roberts. Here's what Wilkerson said. Why, one week they're singing for Jesus, and the next they're performing in the Playboy Club. Of course, a reference to Pat Boone. And he says, one unnamed performer, not known here to have a Christian background, he was photographed in a whiskey advertisement in the newspapers one week and then the next week 
He is photographed in another ad promoting a popular religious special on television. The article goes on to say, of course, he was talking about Oral Roberts. I don't know if you're aware of it, but Oral Roberts has had a lot of people on there that are questionable. We're just going to have to recognize, friends, that a lot of things are happening today to and through charismatics that if you just follow the mainstream and go along with the crowd, you're going to be caught up with that and you're going to lose what little you gain. Well, he didn't hesitate to mention their names and he goes on to say that we have been so enamored with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we can no longer discern the difference between right and wrong. We applaud when we ought to be mourning. He said, that's why we have celebrity converts who can move freely with the jet set one day and move in a prayer meeting the next. He says, this has got to stop. Well, of course, that's a whole front page article on that, but this is what we're talking about. They're trying to put the new wine experience in the old wine ways of the world. And the Bible commands that we are to avoid even the appearance of evil. The Bible says, Wherefore come you out from among them, saith the Lord, and be ye separate. And generally those people who are involved in this sort of entertainment industry and competitive sports, they're not out there to give a witness. Don't you fall for that old excuse to justify their pride, why they don't want to give up the ways of the world. They're not out there to give a testimony. They're not out there singing little courses about Jesus or preaching or witnessing because if they were, they wouldn't be there. They wouldn't put up with it. Oh, I'm not saying occasionally somebody doesn't mention the name of Christ or talk to somebody in a locker room. That's getting glorified all over the place when they do. We're not saying they don't, but their witness is tainted because I read here, avoid even the appearance of evil. Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. It's not out of order to raise the question if these people are really saved themselves. Because everything in the Bible and church history contradicts what they say is possible. That you can mingle with the world and be in fellowship with God at the same time. Have they never read what Jesus said? That you can't do that? What God said, you can't do that? In James 4, 4, be ye not friends with the world? Know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy with God. Amen. Now let those who justify their continuance in the entertainment industry answer that one. James chapter 4 and verse 4. It's not valid for you to say, well, Jesus ate with sinners. People are always trying to justify sin in somebody's life or their compromising ways. We'll say, well, Jesus ate with sinners. I've had people tell me, that. well, I'll go anywhere to witness to a sinner, which is not the point at all. Certainly ate with sinners, but he wasn't dancing and singing with them. He wasn't left end on the house of David's football team. Maybe he could touch somebody. He wasn't singing in Herod's Playboy Hotel in Jerusalem. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> you go eat with all the sinners you want. I recommend it if you take them the gospel. That's what he did. He didn't fellowship with sinners and partake of their ways and dance with navel hanging out belly dancers. I mean, where are these people at anyway? Have they ever read this Bible? There are other passages in there they ought to read besides where Jesus ate with sinners. We're told that. And if we condemned a person with eating with sinners and they were there witnessing to them, then that would be wrong. But you better believe it. They're not staying in this prideful occupation because they're there to witness to sinners. They're there because they're still not delivered from their love of the world. I just read an article in a Jewish paper, Jewish Christian charismatic paper, and a leading article, this girl told how just thought of suicide and everything else, and Jesus came into her life. And it was a beautiful testimony, and then she run it in the last paragraph because she was in the entertainment field, television and all of that, you know, the secular aspect, 
And the last paragraph, after giving a beautiful testimony, said, well, I suppose you think that I left the entertainment industry, don't you? She says, no, I didn't. In fact, I'm doing more now than ever. And they print that, you know, like that's a glowing testimony. Here we've got a TV star who says, I believe in Jesus. And this is what charismatics are looking for, the spectacular, a beauty queen, a sports figure, and say, see, it doesn't matter how deep you've been in sin, God's saving everybody. And you know, the church is so spiritually barren and lacking in discernment today that they will actually take a beauty queen who's parading her body on Monday for everybody to lust after. I used to be in that business, freelance photography in Florida. And women dress that way for only one purpose. And the sexier and the more they can show, those are the ones who are going to win. And they'll take those people who parade their bodies on Monday and ask them into their pulpits on Sunday to tell how God made it all possible. Now, God didn't call any woman to cause a man to lust after. And yet, right in the school where I taught, glorifying a Miss America. You know, all they emphasize, she plays the violin and she can cook. What about all the other took to win that title? And the sports figures who break one another's legs and bloody their noses and gouge eyes out and then get in the pulpit on Sunday because they found Christ and tell how their life has not been the same since they found Jesus. <laughs> not been the same? What's different? Why, if you didn't do all those things I mentioned, they'd kick you off the team. You have to kill your opponent. <laughs> You'll never make it today or they'll kill you. <laughs> Be a witness out there at the left end on whatever team. What kind of a witness? That you're a steamroller. <laughs> well, while we're on the subject, pride is a reason that people want to excel in competitive sports. Do a little study in history. This is Greek Hellenism. This comes right out of Greece. And the Jews as well as the Christians would have nothing to do with it. It's a God that comes right out of Greece, Greek Hellenism. No, you can't put this new wine into old wineskins where you're talking about the old wineskin of the world or the wineskin of man's religion. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, all things are become new. What's new if you stay in the industry? To save it for Christ. You know, if we get out of it, Pat Boone said, we'll leave it to the devil. Well, who does he think's got it? God has never been in the entertainment industry, any part of it. Then a third significant area that I want to deal with briefly where charismatic brothers and sisters are trying to put new wine into old wineskins is in the area of the Word of God. The Word of God. Now when the Holy Spirit comes in John 16, 13, Jesus said He comes to enlighten your mind to all truth. That's His ministry. Now hear what we say. When the Holy Spirit comes, He said He's going to teach you the truth. And because of fear, or pride, or stubbornness, or all of those reasons, most charismatics won't let him perform that ministry in their lives. They stay right within the old wineskin and quench the new wine of the Spirit. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to teach you truth, guide you into all truth. And people hold on to untruth and man's ways and man's doctrines and will fight to hold on to it. I wonder if you're aware that most charismatic Christians have really not changed their minds about much of anything. Holy Spirit's supposed to come to change our minds. Teach us truth. My he had to change my mind about a lot of things. One was the baptism itself. But are you aware the average charismatic Christian has changed his or her mind very little? Except maybe about the baptism and about the fact that God does heal today, where before they weren't too sure about that. But outside of that, where have they changed? Now, I'm talking about the average person. 
is trying to put this new wine into the old wineskins of man's teaching. Here we're talking about the Word of God versus man's teaching, new wine versus old wine. They still have the old wineskin teaching concerning healing. You know, they would never consider calling an elder. They call the doctor. They still have the old wineskin teaching concerning the initial evidence of the baptism. It may surprise you how many charismatics do not have any opinion about whether or not speaking in tongues is evidence of the baptism. Most of them will tell you, well, I don't think it's necessary, even though they speak in tongues. They still have the old wineskin teaching concerning prayer. They pray if it be thy will. I'm talking about charismatics. They still have the old wineskin teaching concerning clergy and laity because they get the baptism instead of functioning charismatically in body ministry, they go right back into the old dead system and sit there as spectators listening to sermons. You know, if all you did was come and sit, we'd be wasting your time and mind and God's too. But when they find that the old wineskin of man's teachings won't hold the new wine, instead of giving up the old wineskin, they hold on to it for dear life and let the wine spill or go to waste, unused. Now that is precisely where it's at. You just can't gainsay that. That's just the way it is. And Jesus said when the Spirit comes, the new wine, He's going to restore the pattern of the church. He's going to restore the truth. He's not going to renew anything. He's going to restore what Jesus established to begin with. When the Holy Spirit comes, He's going to enable you to hear the voice of the shepherd. Now some people can't hear the voice of the shepherd. I'll tell you why. It's because they're waiting on the shepherd to speak directly to their hearts or audibly or whatever. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Well, he isn't going to shout down out of heaven. He isn't going to give you a revelation. Now, he can give revelations. But if you're waiting on a revelation, you're going to miss it. Because he's already giving you the revelation through his anointed vessels. Through his word that you read. Through communion as you pray. That's the way he's going to speak to you. And some people cannot hear the voice of the shepherd because they're too busy looking at the earthen vessel that he's speaking through. And they're missing the faith message. They're missing the end time message. They're missing what God wants to do in their life because they're waiting for something to happen direct or in some other way. Now these are not the ones who are substituting man's ways Man's word for God's word, these are the ones that are waiting for a word from God and they don't realize that he's already giving it to them. I say that because there are people that have sat under this ministry that didn't recognize what they had. And we're trying to alert you, dear friends, without saying more than we're permitted to say. You check the message out that we gave you tonight. This is a good place to start with the word of God, prayerfully, sincerely. And you'll find out that would pay you to start listening to the shepherd through the earthen vessel instead of looking at the earthen vessel. A lot of people say, well, I can pick and choose what I want to do or believe or obey because he's an earthen vessel like I am. That's where you miss it. Because we are earthen vessels just like you. The shepherd is speaking through earthen vessels. That's the only way he's going to speak to you. The word that God is giving us has to be vindicated to our hearts before he's going to vindicate it with signs and wonders. We don't need the signs and wonders. They're coming. That's for Warsaw. That's for Kosciuszko County. That's for Indiana. That's for the United States, the world. God is trying to vindicate his word to you now in a tent. And then when his word is vindicated to your heart, you know this is right. And you quit resisting you start walking the total faith way regardless of what the coroner or anyone else says. Once that word is so vindicated to you, as one brother said when they said, what does that church teach over there? What do those people believe? He said, I don't know what they believe, but I can tell you what I believe. And that's why I'm not going to go around and defend you to coroners and police and authorities. We're giving you the word so you can stand and tell them, here's what I believe. We're not an organization. What's my word? 
I can't say this is the faith assembly incorporated and therefore this is our doctrinal position. We got no position that anybody will accept. You got to be incorporated to be accepted. Amen. So God must vindicate his word to your hearts now. That's of the Lord. If you can't receive it, you're going to be miserable because it's going to get stronger. I just want to close with another article. I had a lot of things here I cut out along this line. This goes with the teaching that some are trying to mingle the new wine with the old worldly ways. And this came across my desk recently. And I want you to think about it because it's a part of what is wrong with the charismatic mentality today. Now I didn't write this, it's entitled A Lousy Testimony. <laughs> and it's a liturgical church letter, so it isn't some uneducated Pentecostal saying it. You know what we mean by that, we're not criticizing, but some people say that with a title like that it would have to come out of some head that had nothing in it. Well. The article says, do you think that Jesus has a lousy testimony? According to our usual idea of a good testimony, Jesus does not come through very well. Now we're talking about sports figures, TV personalities, movie stars that say, you know, I used to ride horses and go bang bang with guns, but now I'm roping them in for Jesus. I'm not putting down a person who was in that and gets saved, but when they stay in it, all right, this is what he's addressing himself to. He said, do you think Jesus had a lousy testimony according to what's supposed to be a good testimony today? You know, among charismatics, Jesus does not come through very well. Jesus was never a member of Hell's Angels Motorcycle Club. He was never on drugs. He never stole, he never murdered, he never spent time in prison. But Jesus was the one who was tempted in all points as we are and yet without sin. That's his testimony. Now I'll tell you, this has been a burden on my heart when I sometimes hear people giving testimonies and they tell you every act of fornication and rape and drugs and robbery as if that edifies some sinner out there that, well, you couldn't be as bad off as I am and so you can get saved too. He's turning this thing around. I agree with him. I certainly do. I've been waiting for somebody to say it before I did. Why is this important for us to see? Because we often think that the more of a gutter to God testimony one has, the better he can relate to people in sharing Christ. Now there's something wrong with our thinking. I've heard some testimonies, I'll tell you, that it just didn't edify. Terrible. Can you imagine Christians standing up and telling their sins? I'm not saying that as the Holy Spirit leads, there are certain things you couldn't mention. But I'm talking about detailing your sins. Well, he says, I by no means want to belittle the glorious redemption and healing that our Lord has done in those lives that were at one time deeply messed up and trapped in sin. But I do want us to understand something that we miss due to this false orientation. Here is the key. It's not how deep in sin we were that will help someone out of their sin, but rather how yielded to the Lord we now are as a vessel of God's redemptive grace to them. Being a pure channel of the Holy Spirit will speak to people. It will give them hope. Oh, I don't know why we can't see that. I don't know why, but we hear too often the other. Notice how true this is of our Lord's ministry. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Hebrews 2.18 Jesus was tempted, yet without sin. He overcame, and he gives us the hope of overcoming. See, it's just the opposite. Praise God. Don't detail your sordid life. Say, like Paul, I was a chief of sinners. Now, I'm not going to tell you how and what ways I was a chief and I overcame by his grace. That helps me to believe I can overcome. 
Jesus overcame. He gives us the hope of overcoming. Not in being tempted and sinning, but in being tempted and being victorious. Most people haven't murdered or raped or pushed drugs or spent time up the river, but they're just as much in need of God's love and forgiveness because there are other sins such as anger and selfishness and hatred and lust and self-righteousness. You know, if you have to identify with this gutter snipe to God business, they don't identify with that. They think they do. You know, if I can tell us how bad it is and I'll reach some people, that isn't the philosophy of the New Testament. Because he says here, we all need God's redemptive grace and it's just as big a sin to hate as it is to rob a bank. And so the Lord's sympathy and his ability to aid comes not out of being caught in some sin, but in his being tempted and staying pure and spotless. It is God's righteousness in us that one will convict people of their sins as they see God's righteousness in you. It will convict them of their sins, no matter how small that sin may be, compared to those big things that some testimonies give. And two, it's God's righteousness in us that will show them that it's possible to be clean, to be free, and to be enjoying it. Amen. Jesus actually has the best testimony of anyone. For the Father said of him, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That's the testimony. Tell people God is well pleased in you now that you're no longer pushing drugs and whatever. If we are pleasing to the Father and know our testimony in him, then we will be ministers to others. The presence of his life, of his spirit, and of his wisdom will make us ample counselors. Would you stand please? Father, as you have imparted to us your truth through the word, and as you have sent us the teacher of that truth, who can give us understanding, even the Holy Spirit, and as you have commissioned us to go teach all things that Jesus commanded, to leave nothing out, to add nothing to it, then we submit ourselves to this responsibility as a body, as a church. And we would not, by your grace, we would not deviate to the right nor to the left. Whether it's to please man or to please an angel. And we ask that your special anointing of grace will be upon this message wherever it's heard both here and afar. Because, Father, we see the urgency of your people who are being baptized in the Spirit, being able to discern these subtle little deceptions that are leading so many back into the old wineskins of man's ways and the ways of the world and to the word of man and your sheep are being deceived and they do not see that there's no matter of degree in deception that a small deception or a large one that they're still deceived we pray that they will see that they must be alert to what's happening they must study your word they must stay in close fellowship with you and know that men today are using terms that are not in God's word charismatic renewal and using scripture to justify building hospitals and calling it a city of faith. And using the word of God to justify living and fellowshipping and carousing with sinners because Jesus ate with them. And Father, we pray that people will get their eyes open and pray for these who profess Christ and who claim to have the same experience that their eyes will be open to see that you cannot put the new wine message in the old wine skins. To be diligent to present it, but at the same time not compromise it. One iota. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.